can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Alex Chan of Antisocial Solutions. And Alex, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Since this is part of the Top Agency series, and we were just chatting about selling a company, which you did, um, I had Todd Tasky on. Uh, Todd Tasky actually runs the Second Bite podcast where he pairs agencies with private equity and helps sell agencies. So it's very interesting because he finds sometimes people make more on the second bite than they do on the first, right? Because um, private equity sells again. So it's just interesting to hear the valuation, the agency space and everything that like that. And Jason Swank, I also has had on, who has an agent, he sold, built his agency up to eight figures and sold it and then started a group to help agency owners. Um, he also started buying up agencies as well. Um, and so uh, he also talked about the landscape um, and of the valuation in the agency space. And that was also, there are two interviews on that one. Those are really good. So check those out. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships and partnerships. Uh, how do we do that? We do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. So, Alex, we call ourselves the magic elves that run in the background and make it look easy for the host so they can create amazing content, create amazing relationships, and most importantly, run their business. You know, for me, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So, if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Alex Chan. He's an entrepreneur who's created and sold multiple businesses. He's got experience in mergers and acquisitions. He's the founder of Antisocial Solutions, which was founded in 2014. It was acquired by Thinking Box Media and Design. The company operates in cities all over Canada, the US, Vancouver, Toronto, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, New York. And uh, Alex, I'm excited to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Just start us off with antisocial and what you do. And I'm going to, for people listening to the audio, there is a video version. I'm going to share their screen. Uh, beautiful looking website. So Alex, tell us more about antisocial solutions. Yeah, antisocial solutions. Yeah, you, you got it. We were founded in 2014. We started off mainly as a social media agency. It was kind of during a time where social media was, had been around for quite a bit, but was still in the process of getting picked up by companies. The reality was, is that nobody really knew exactly how to market on there. I remember at one point Disney saying that, you know, every like that they got on their Facebook page was a worth a dollar per person, which we definitely know that that wouldn't be the case in today's time. Um, the cost of managing was so high back then that no real large agency knew how to come up with a process behind it. Now, fortunately, we were young. We had a lot of team members on the team that were young. And as a result, they lived and breathed social media well ahead of other large agency owners or even large experienced agency people. And when we think about social media, the reality is that it's really only been around for 10, 15 years. And to be an expert in something, you know, it takes about that amount of time so um we really caught a good wave it caught an upward trend during that time and social media started to take off um because it was such an easy way for restaurants to acquire new customers that those became our first set of clientele for us to kind of cut our teeth learn how to build processes that we then were able to apply to the corporate world what made you start the agency? I know that you had a brewery. I don't know if that was kind of the inception of why you got into this in the first place. Uh, before this, I was just what you just call a publisher. I, I started goofing around the internet back in the 90s as a kid. And then around the 2000s, we actually ran a number of websites 
Uh, and those collectively, those websites had over a million unique visitors per day. You know, that's when in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have sold that <laughs> network. But at the time, <clears throat> and we were... Were they on specific topics or what, what was, were you... Back then, you, you know, there were really weren't a lot of websites. Like there were a few smaller websites like or like E-Bombs World and like Google didn't exist. YouTube didn't exist. Um, a funny video website, funny picture website could generate tens of thousands of viewers really overnight and sustain it overnight once people knew who you were just because they didn't know who to go to at the time. The search engines were based off of Lycos and Alta Vista, which were okay. And even then someone loading up a computer wouldn't necessarily know to go to those websites first. Uh, so we were able to really capture the college crowd during that time. And that's kind of when websites like College Humor, uh, I think uh, break.com, um, which then later got acquired by Lionsgate, um, started to really build, generate traffic. And we were actually working with a lot of them during that time, just because back then there weren't a lot of us. Did you end up selling those sites? Yeah, we ended up selling those sites. Um, that was during a time when I was living in Vancouver. Uh, I met a team in Toronto that also had another network of sites. You know, it's as a publisher, all of your revenue is very heavily based off of ad revenue, and it has not changed in 20, 30 years. It's always it's always the case. Um, and at the time, we kind of wanted to move closer to the source where we were no longer the ones kind of receipt, generating clicks, generating views in order to receive ad revenue, but rather to launch our own ad network and kind of get out and build our own stuff. So that's when we moved to Toronto. Uh, in hindsight, we should have kept all of our assets because they were such high traffic generating websites. We could have actually just been our own ad network with our own sites, but we sold our websites and our network and then used that money to launch our own network from there. How do you evaluate that at the time? Are you evaluating it off of revenue? If it is off a of profit, how are you, you know, creating evaluation on what to sell these things for? Because kind of the wild west at the time, a little bit, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's still, it still very much is. Uh, you know, some things don't change though, and I wish I knew a lot of this back then, which is probably where you know finding a good mentor is necessary as you grow. Uh, Ultimately, your business is always based off of your net value. You always think your business is worth a million dollars because you make a million dollars. But if you only get to keep a dollar at the end of the day, why would anyone want to purchase you for a million dollars? That doesn't change regardless of what type of company you have. Now, there's certain industries where something is worth more and there's certain aspects of a business or assets in there that might be worth more. But the reality is that the person giving you money still wants to know when they're going to make their money back. So that was very true back then then when it came to selling the network and the websites, they looked at our net revenue, the potential of net revenue, what they could grow it to, what they could sell it for, what they could generate from it. And they gave us kind of numbers based off of that. Um, at the time, it was based off of somewhere anywhere between eight months to three years of your net revenue, depending on how large your site was and what kind of assets you had around it and your niche, of course. So what made you ultimately then fast forward to starting Antisocial? Why did you start it? Well, we were always really good at SEO. We were always really good at web development. That was kind of all there was back then. And as 2012 kicked in, we actually sold our affiliate network as well, too. Um, so that that sale actually completed in 2010. I moved to uh, Whistler in 2010. 2011, 2012, and I basically set up shop here um, and just called it what I what I thought would be early retirement. Um, as we kind of continue to grow and build and launch new websites, um, just because we were doing it in our spare time, we started to build new traffic. But one thing that we were never able to do was generate a lot of traffic through social media. So we started to spend time learning how to do it, and ultimately teamed up with a couple of people that knew it very well. Um, my former business partner, Daryl Louie, as well, too, he was very well versed in social at the time and had a few clients based in Vancouver. So I teamed up with him, brought in my business experience and web development experience, and we decided to launch an agency focused on social media, mainly to power my projects, which, but ultimately this company took off and those projects went to the side. Just walk me through, kind of like fast forward me through the different business ventures. So you start off, you have a network of sites. 
Um, it sounds like somewhere in there is a brewery. Somewhere in there is antisocial. <laughs> and even before antisocial, someone there is an affiliate network that you that you built up and sold. So if we just start chronologically, what are some of the different business ventures that uh, you had? Yeah, I guess so fr- coming from the network of sites, you know, moving to Toronto, we built the affiliate network. The affiliate network got built up. Uh, that got sold around 2009, 2010, came to Whistler. Um, a good friend came up, told me about a venture on the East Coast uh, to open up a restaurant, which was uh, one of the warehouse group chains. Um, so that would be Bloor Street Warehouse. And then so we invested in that. From there, learned a lot about the restaurant industry, decided to produce our own beer because we're buying beer from everyone else and we're moving a lot of it. So then invested in a brewery to kind of add to that. And in that process, NA Social was growing as well, too. And NA Social was serving as our kind of a marketing arm for all of these different uh, assets. Okay, so we're antisocial. Talk about the evolution of services with antisocial because it's obviously you started off with social media, um, and then how did it evolve from there? Uh, from social media, that lead that led to basically everything else as well too, right? Marketing is, and when we talk about marketing, it's especially at today's age, like that 360 marketing campaign involves everything, your website, your social, your uh, different channels of social, which are all completely uniquely different. And then you've got your media buying, which is a Google AdWords, AdSense, Facebook ads, your website, uh, SEO on top of that, you know, where do you invest your time and money at the end of the day? So with our clients at the time, social media was in demand. Nobody knew how to do it. Restaurants knew that it was their ticket to get people in the door. And so our first clients were very heavily based on in the restaurant industry. At the time, around 2014, 2015, People were really just resharing everything on social media. Nobody was actually creating original content and nobody really understood what that meant for social at that time. Fortunately, because I already had a number of publishing websites that were already creating content, we knew the value of it. You know, there's the old saying and still today to this day is that content is king. That's why we're having this chat now. And as a result, we decided to launch a photo video arm. And we started capturing photo and video photography for the restaurants, including that in our packages as a mandatory purchase, because if you try to sell it to them, they'll never buy it. So it was easier to sell it in a bundle. Um, Once we started shooting photo video content for our clients, though, then all of a sudden that got us noticed by bigger uh, corporate clients. So I want to talk about your first clients, how you got your first clients. So talk about how you got your first clients. What was the first memorable milestone client? Uh, in Vancouver, and they were actually already a client with uh, Daryl at the time because he was he was already working with them as a freelancer, but he didn't have his own agency yet created at the time. Um, they're they're a local pub group in Vancouver called the Donnelly Group. And they actually at the time they were really dominating in terms of the clubs club space uh, because we were working with them. We also worked with their main competitor which was called Blueprint. And that ultimately led to basically every restaurant in Vancouver, every restaurant, pub, and nightclub in Vancouver, um, kind of either having a conversation with them to manage or even actually taking the project on. And then fast forward a little bit, what was another milestone of from a, a client perspective? Because I know you've worked with companies from like the Fairmount, 7-Eleven, and many more. What was another milestone? Yeah, the I'd say that our big our first big corporate client was one of Jim Pattison's companies. Uh, we started working with uh, Save On Foods, which is uh, big in Vancouver. Um, they they basically came on and said, "We need social, and we don't know how to do it." Uh, we pitched them with what we thought was the right package for them, and as we worked with them throughout that year, they started to need photo, video, more community management, more management, more posts. Uh, what did the, they do? Uh, their grocery, their grocery chain here. Yeah, they, it's, they're probably, I don't know, I'd like to say the second large, maybe the largest, second largest. Um, they, they basically. How did they find had, you? Pardon me? How did they find you? 
uh, they saw a lot of our photo video content and there, and at the time there weren't a lot of companies doing social media. Cause if you went to some of the bigger agencies, like the cassettes, the, um, at the time there was another call, company called Invoke yet, OMDs, right? Like really global agencies, they were not willing to touch social media at all. The cost of them to even look at your social would have been anywhere between 30 to $60,000 a month. And with no real ROI coming from social at that time, there was no real desire for any corporate client to invest at that level. Um, you, we were talking before we hit record and you said one of the things that you learn, one of the learnings was learning to pitch. Yeah, that is an ongoing, <laughs> that doesn't change. You are always learning to pitch really from the start, from day one, when you launch your business all the way until you maybe sell it or you decide to retire. And you're probably still pitching it when you're retired because you're telling people about it. Uh, pitching at all different levels is completely different. You are, it requires different level of investment, whether it's like the expertise, the team members that you need to hire in order to fill the gaps, or you launching new services or products that you've never done before to fill gaps in order to make it work, or even just like investing heavily in putting together presentations and decks as you move up the ladder. Fortunately, in the very beginning, when you're a junior agency, you just have to tell people about yourself, show a few examples of work, and you're good to go. As you grow, you start to have to build case studies. Now you need to start talking about why you're special and what you've done, what you've accomplished as you start to move up that corporate ladder. From then on, you move into a smaller pool. As you get higher and higher, the number of clients reduce. The budgets increase, but the number of clients shrink. And that is actually a big challenge because now you're up against agencies that have been around for maybe 30, even 50 years. A lot of companies came from print, radio, television, and they have been around for decades with tons of experience, tons of expertise under their belt and lots of connections. Now, as a new company into that space, now you have to prove yourself. You have to decide, like, how are you going to get in? And sometimes that means taking on projects from agencies to fill gaps for them to get you started. You know, now all of a sudden you decide you don't want to share the pie. You want to move up even further. You start to want to take on the, the actual contract and be the one that divides the pie, which is the best place to be. Now you're in the same room as these agencies, as these top dogs, and they know the language. They know how to talk to these people. And they also know really what, how to pitch in that situation. So you're always constantly learning and hopefully if you've hired correctly, you've got some good talent that's able to fill those gaps. What's some examples of mistakes? Maybe you've never made any mistakes in your <laughs> career, Alex, but some mistakes that you remember when you were pitching. Oh, not listening. <laughs> I mean, that's probably the one, you know, the most important part. And that's the one thing everyone forgets. Uh, yeah, just like not taking the time to really hear what the client has to say. Even if they don't know what they want, they still have a general idea of what they need. And if you don't understand that aspect, you won't win. How did that play out? Do you remember a time? Well, you walk away feeling great because you talk for 20, 60 minutes. <laughs> um, you know, but getting a call back is, uh, you know, the next step. And usually they will just Did say, someone actually say to you? I mean... You know, because if you go, like you said, walk away and you're like, that was amazing. And you talk for 30 minutes. Did a company actually come back and be like, Alex, you know, you just talked too much. You didn't listen to what we had to say. I don't know. Did you get that That's, feedback? I, I wish someone had said that to us because it mm -hmm. probably made our would have made our learning experience a lot better. <laughs> we probably made that mistake a dozen times before we finally learned uh, how to ask for help. But um, I think the the big thing with that is, you know, you get those you get those. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You uh, we've gone with someone else emails. You get a few of those and you start to have to realize, hey, like, what are we doing that's not right? Or what do we have to change? So not listening. Uh, what else? Uh, not coming and prepared. You know, knowing your client is big. Uh, learning who they are, what they do, what regions they're in. Learning the people that you're going to be talking to, what level of people you're going to be talking to. As you start to work with larger and larger clients, you're not going to be talking to the CEO and the chief operator and the CFO anymore. 
You know, in the very beginning, it was all partners, but now you're dealing with a marketing manager. And now the question becomes, are you empowering the marketing manager with enough experience and knowledge to then pass that information up to their superiors to where they're interested enough to have another conversation with you? That is, that's a challenge and another learning lesson that took some practice. Talk about that a little bit, because that comes up often on interviews where they're talking to someone who's in charge, but maybe they're not the end decision maker. How do you navigate that to, because ultimately you're thinking what you just said is you need to talk to the, you know, the board or the partners or whoever is in charge. How do you navigate that with the, that person? Well, a lot of tricks, you know, you learn, learn a lot of stuff along the way, right? As you're, as you're researching the company, go through their LinkedIn, figure out who's in charge so that when their name or email is in the thread, you can acknowledge them if they're actually in communicating with you, or you know that they're there. So they're at least going to read your emails or receive the deck that you're about to send forward. Now that's, it's definitely like step one. That's even before you walked in the room. You know, the next thing we always told our staff was, you know, if you're working with someone, you ask yourself how you can get the other person to raise, right? It's a, it's a good way to look at it because then you can go, what can I do to help this person so that they understand what's going on here? And what can I do to make their lives easier so that they will want to work with me? They'll become champions of my company in their company because we do so much to help them that when they move up and as they as you build a long term relationship with them and this person continues to move through one manager role to another, you're building people within that company and building a stronger relationship between your two yeah, I love it because what you just said there, I wrote down, um, it's a great phrase that sticks out, which is what can I do to make your life easier? Because it's really ultimately helping them in the company, but like helping them individually to make their life easier is, you know, a, a personal incentive, I imagine. Yeah, that's, uh, that's ultimately why they reached out. Uh, typically, a company will try to manage all their marketing in the very beginning in house until they realize they can't or until they realize there's a certain level of expertise that they need to hire for. Now, whether they choose to hire in house or whether they choose to go with an agency, so obviously pros and cons to both going with the more expensive option in agency, then you're always faced with the challenge of if they're going to be spending, let's say $60,000 with you, why don't they hire someone for 60,000? So then what are you doing more and what are you doing to help the person that you're working with? You know, you talked a lot about hiring, having a team members. Talk about the evolution of the team a little bit when you first started antisocial and some of the key hires along the way. Um, you know, it's it's pretty funny. Yeah, hiring is is one of those things that never changes. It's always a challenge. <laughs> uh, finding people within the talent pools uh, of you really the world, you know, you start to realize how small those talent pools become as you get higher and higher, how much more expensive those pools <laughs> become as you tap larger and larger groups. So in the very beginning, like all small businesses, you hire who you can afford, you hire who's around, you hire who has a little bit of experience in your sector. As you grow and you start to seek people who maybe have more pitch experience, who maybe have more understanding in that sector, or maybe even if you're a growing agency and you don't actually have real agency experience, because you have a team of juniors or and it's just you leading the pack, you then need, might need someone who could be an operator, someone who comes from an agency background with more agency experience. All those people are more expensive. They came from roles that they have a lot more experience in. And your hope is that your investment in them pays off. Because at the end of the day, if a person costs you $125,000, you're not going to know whether or not they're the perfect fit for a few months. So that's your investment. So when you're hiring, you need to really take that into consideration. How long of a runway can I give the person I'm hiring? And you know, or during that process, you're just hoping for the best. When you first started, obviously it's you, you had a partner. Yeah. Yeah. I worked with uh, my partner, Daryl Louie uh, here in Vancouver. And then when you decided to grow, what point did you hire your first staff? 
Uh, we kind of hired right out the gate. Uh, we needed community managers. Back, back then, social media was a lot less content and a lot more community management. And as we all know, community management is the most difficult thing to deal with, <laughs> for especially as a company who has product services and lots of clients. The, we actually hired a number of people right out of college, right out of the service industry, right out of restaurants. Uh, the reality was, was that nobody above the age of 20, 25 really knew how to work with social media at the time. Uh, it was so new and so fresh. Anyone who was in their mid twenties were already too busy with their lives to spend all day on social. You actually needed someone that was somewhere between the age of like 18 and 25 who had that time in their life to play with social media, to then become the people who can champion and say, this is what needs to be posted. This is what needs to be created. It's still very valid to this day. Cause I wouldn't trust someone that was 50 or 60 to create my TikTok videos for me. So if you look at the trajectory of, you know, anti-social uh, solutions, um, what was the next kind of key position? So the first you hired community managers, what was the next kind of batch of key positions you had to put in place? Um, then we had, we had some social media managers. Um, their social media managers at that time were also our project managers. So, I mean, more traditional, you could say that you were, had us, the founders, and we were the leadership group, followed by our project managers, which are basically our first hires, but we called them the social managers at the time. Then following that, we moved into the community managers, and that became kind of our initial structure for quite some time. Of course, photographers, videographers as well, too. Too, but they were on the side as well too and they kind of supported the whole um the whole hierarchy in that you mentioned the hiring process um and how important it is because you're investing a lot of time and money what did you what were some of the learnings from the hiring process and maybe some of the mistakes in the beginning maybe you left out of the hiring process that now you include because uh, <laughs> you've you know you've you've learned I mean, the, I'd say the biggest mistake in the beginning was hiring our friends <laughs> um, as much as, you know, that's, it's, it's, that's a lot more common than we, than we actually think when you're starting a new business and you're getting your business up and running, you kind of just look around within your circles and go, Hey, who can I hire? Who can fill this super easy role? Cause the demand isn't that high just at that point yet. The thing is, is that as you start, I mean, it seems like you have smart friends. I mean, you're in engineering, so I don't know. If that, <laughs> we're you know. fortunate. Yeah. Unfortunately, engineers are some of the hardest people to work with. So, <laughs> so, you know, for good or bad, they're definitely uh, very clever. <laughs> um, the, the challenge with hiring friends is, you know, you have an authority, uh, a little bit of an authority issue there. You know, you're, you're trying to hang out with them on one side while you're trying to tell them what to do on the other. And sometimes it just doesn't get taken that well. Um, or, you know, worse, because they're your friends, they just might choose to not do what you ask them to do and do what they want to do. Um, you, you, hopefully those expectations get kind of set in the very beginning. But back to just see whether you have the experience to set those expectations or not. Like it's... Uh, it's not something that we're taught. It's not something that you initially start with unless maybe you had an HR background. And even then I wonder, you know, if that's something that you have to learn. What are some of those essential important steps that you put in place in the hiring process? Boundaries are, are a beautiful thing, right? Good fences make great neighbors. Uh, you need to really define what you expect out of someone in terms of whether it's like work life culture, whether it's the uh, whether it's the expectation of, you know, how you want work to be delivered, or even just showing up on time, believe it or not, in today's age, that's actually something harder and harder to accomplish um, than ever before. The, the big thing for us was really defining what the roles meant. In the very beginning, especially with a small company or small agency, everyone is wearing a lot of hats. Keeping someone within their kind of playpen is almost impossible. Someone who is a manager is going to become the manager of multiple things just because they're already a manager with experience managing. You're going to lean on them more. Now, don't come in and just go, we're just instantly going to pay you more because we're giving you more work. It's up to the leadership to balance that work schedule with them to kind of come up with something that works and continue to build a proper structure and properly scale your business, including 
raises, bonuses, whatever you've lined up and make sure that's adequate for them as well as sustainable for the business during that growth. Anything in the interview process itself to weed people out or to get to a, this person looks really good. Um, you know, it's, so many candidates come through and so many are great. Uh, it's actually very difficult to tell the difference between all of them, especially when you just look at a resume. Now, I could only imagine what an Amazon would have to deal with when they deal with like a thousand resumes. You know, one HR person that I talked to once told me that they hired based on whether they were kind. <laughs> um, and I kind of thought about that. I was like, what do you mean if they're just nice? Like, are they just nice and they come in and they're friendly to everyone? No, no. Like, are they kind? Are they willing to go out of their way to help people? Are they willing to volunteer themselves to help out with other things that they maybe don't even know about? Or just spend a little extra time to learn something that they don't know in order to be better at what they do because they know it'll help their teammates. Uh, when we started to hire based on that, that helped a lot. Whether someone was the right fit or not, they were the right character. And that character really allowed that person to grow within our organization. Because when we hired the best of the best, they were sometimes really hard to work with and ultimately didn't grow and actually made things too more challenging. What were some of the things you do to determine that kindness in the interview process? Oh, well, you know, you, you, have to really trust your gut, <laughs> um, which is tough because, yeah, how do you put that into a scalable you know, process? Uh, we would ask people some odd questions as well, too. I think one of the questions I remember asking all the time was, you know, give me a moment where you've been uncomfortable at work and how you managed to get through that. You know, the reality is that you're going to be very uncomfortable when you're learning something new. You're going to be very uncomfortable when you're taking on a new role. And if someone does not like being comfortable, that's perfectly fine. But then you have to decide whether or not that role that you're about to put them into is right for them. A community manager will be very comfortable. It's a very easy role in terms of just following up with people and knowing how to respond to people. But being a chief operating officer is a challenging role that is going to put you in some very difficult shoes. You mentioned, you know, as far as People are, you know, staff can get busy. How do you manage that balance of staff keeping busy without sustaining burnout? <laughs> Some tums. <laughs> um, you know, there's no perfect formula for that. It's it's going to come and go. I think this is back to having kind staff or having people in the company that are kind. You know, they they need to also understand that, you know, you we're we as management or as leadership or partners or founders, whatever you want to call us, are doing the best they can to balance with what resources are available. And sometimes the scales tip and become more challenging for the people within the company. Sometimes they're more challenging for the founders within the company. Um, when it becomes more challenging for the staff, it is very important for the leadership to acknowledge that, understand that that's happening, and put steps in to either mitigate and avoid it from happening at all in the future, but also also take care of the immediate problem and give that person the time off necessary so they don't burn out. You know, you ended up selling to Thinking Box. Um, just talk about your decision to decide to sell the company in the first place. Yeah, we were, you know, we were, we were in what we just call a hyper growth phase. You know, we were doubling our revenues and doubling our staff. Uh, basically year over year for about three, four, five years straight. It was an exhausting and expensive process. Uh, the, the nice part was that we were generating enough revenue to cover our costs, but we were also spending all of our profit reinvesting it every step of the way so the founders as us we weren't getting any more comfortable <laughs> we were things life wasn't just getting better we weren't buying homes or jumping on boats we we're actually busier than ever before and we were actually reinvesting the money and creating more work for the general team than ever before we started to really see gaps in our experience as well too uh as much as i would love to say i know everything i really have uh older i get the more realize the less I know. Um, as we started to grow towards the corporate space and as we started to realize how much more competitive it became, we realized that we actually needed to hire some 
very specific talent, people that were going to cost us quite a bit with starting salaries at 125, 140, 165, 250, depending on what city we're trying to move into or expand into, how many flights we had to take around that. We started to realize that the next step of growth would, would have actually cost us millions of dollars. So now, do we slow the business down and decide to just play within our circle and continue to grow? Uh, no, we're young and hungry. That might have actually been the smarter move. I can't go back in time to see whether or not that would have been the right move. We decided to try to find some key partners, whether they would invest in our business and become partners with us or in the other option, acquire us. Uh, ultimately, the company that came across, which was Thinking Box, decided to acquire us. So talk about the conversations and um, initially whether you, you know, you bought, obviously both decided it was a good fit. Um, talk about those initial conversations and what you were discussing to get to the point of, yes, let's do this. Yeah, a lot of research. Um, in, in the agency world, your culture is so important, right? Like it's your Kool-Aid. <laughs> it's a, it's what everyone drinks. It is having a cool, fun company is what keeps your talent around. Uh, it's what keeps, it's what makes people want to join your business as well too. And when you're getting acquired into a new company, the first thing you're really looking at is one, like, do they have the money to be able to pay, you know, what, what we want? Do they have the existing culture where our team is going to merge into? Because if our, we do the acquisition and our team leaves, then what did they acquire? We're, you know, we're back at square one. The clientele that they work with, whether or not they're a good fit for our business, whether or not that's someone that we can merge in as part of the growth, and then the leadership of the other team, whether we're aligned. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of dinners, a lot of conversations about whether or not we align about the same thing. You know, the only tip that I would ever give someone during an, a mer mergers and acquisitions process is that if your gut tells you that the culture and that the fit in the new group isn't right and that's not where you want to be, you should listen to that. So when you were having those discussions, were you talking about what your role would be? Because you're obviously yeah. merging kind of leadership groups. I know every company probably handles it differently. Maybe you operate as a separate entity. Maybe you get absorbed under thinking box. What did that conversation look like? Yeah, there's, uh, the, the, there are so many ways to kind of, uh, to kind of like handle the leadership of a company you're acquiring. Uh, you could, yeah, exactly. All exactly what you touched on. You acquire them. All you want are their assets. You actually just want the team the assets, the process, and you don't want their existing leadership and you send them on their merry way and you do your best to merge everything into your company. And that's in the agency world that happens a lot less uh, because the reality is that agencies don't have a ton of assets. We're not sitting on mountains of real estate. Uh, we have a lot of processes which can be replicated and we have talented team, team members that know those processes that you want to stay and founders that know how everything works. So typically in an agency setting, you are trying to merge the founders or the people, the leadership into your business, at least for a window. That can come in the form of uh, just employment contracts with nice bonuses. That can be a, uh, you can tie it into the mergers and acquisition where the person might need to stay on for a period of time in order for them to get the remainder of their sale. Uh, yeah, for us, they wanted us to stick around. You know, we, we got along well with the leadership. They wanted us to stay. So we were given employment contracts as a founder role where we continue to stay and oversee the overall operation, help with the merger. The reason why we just kept, got the founder role is because ultimately there was no real role that fit or like title that fit. And at the end of the day, a title in, a, in an agency setting is pretty meaningless. But um, we were basically the people who wore every hat and supported in every aspect of the merger. How has what you do changed since the merger? Uh, I, I was handling a lot of the finance in the very beginning. And that was actually one of the reasons why we wanted to move over as well, too. 
you know, when you're managing finances for a hundred thousand dollar business, it's actually not a problem. Million dollar business, no problem. Tens of millions of dollars. Now you have a problem. <laughs> you are now faced with a lot of hard costs adding into your added to your business because you now need a finance team, whether it's someone who just handles invoicing or accounts receivables, or you decide to get out and um, I hire another company to come and do it. Ultimately, if you're crossing that $10 million threshold, you're probably going to need your own internal team. That's part of the added cost that we wanted to avoid ourselves and why we wanted a investor partner. But also more importantly, you know, someone who can actually just take all the finance, build you your projections, and ultimately you're creating a role, CFO type role, whether you call it that or not. How did you communicate with the team Throughout the process, because I know people have various thoughts on this, like sometimes they include people along the journey. Sometimes they tell people when it's done because they don't want to scare people. What how did you end up handling that? Uh, well, because of NDAs, uh, we, we didn't really tell anyone until we were basically sure that we were going to do the acquisition. So in the very beginning, while we're doing all the research, the meetings, the conversations, we didn't really tell the team a lot. They might have known one or two things happening, but uh, yeah, we never really like took the time to do a full brief. Once we decided that this was the move we wanted to make, once we decided that, once we got to the point where we're ready to start making offers, then we started to do introductions. We started to allow our team to meet the leadership of the other team and vice versa. Um, we started spending time at each other's offices in the very beginning as we're going through our due diligence. And then while we, and we had to do a lot of one-on-ones in that process to really reassure the team that you know, our objective was to not turn the table flip the whole business, start all over again, but rather they're acquiring us because they like what we do and how we do it. The objective of the merger was to grow with them, to take on more resources so we could do more, potentially growing our team's careers as well in that process too. So a lot of that led to coaching, everything from coaching to one-on-ones to just talking about the future. What do you, how do you reassure the team? in that situation and because i know you we were talking before you record and some people's positions will change based on it and some may be just worried like they look across the table and go someone over there kind of does what i do um so how do you reassure the team in throughout the the process <laughs> um you know, if someone's genuinely worried there's not much you're going to do about it yeah you can do the best you can to really help them out in that process so that they're not so worried um and hopefully and ultimately we did go in with good intentions and hopefully they they felt that as well too so it, it it's really just about listening to them finding out what their concerns are and then talking to them about what the next steps will be you know fortunately during the actual due diligence process while you're learning about each other and each other's company's roles you do find a lot of things that their team member, even though they're in the same role, doesn't do. And you find out things that your team members do do that will complement the overall operation. It's very rare for a company to come in and immediately remove all the duplicate roles. You know, there is a, there is a long merger process in that. And so there's always a good runway uh, that allows people to transition from one role to another. And that runway also gives people where the choice of whether or not they want to stick around. Um, talk about handling the transition period and when you merge. Yeah, we, the timing was pretty, uh, monumental. <laughs> uh, they, we, we actually completed the deal three days before Canada locked down for uh, COVID. Uh, that created so much panic. It was unreal, especially in the marketing world where companies be began to think about whether or not they would actually make a dollar in the coming months. Because during the initial lockdowns, we were actually told to not do business and not show up to work anymore, where most of our work was being handled. Of course, like all oh, teleconference was not a standard yet. Um, 
calling each other, obviously an option, but not being in the same room together did, was going to create some big challenges. Uh, companies started to drop marketing agencies left and right during that process too, because you know how can we, how could they afford a twenty or thirty thousand dollar a month agency when they're all of a sudden their sales declined by fifty to seventy five percent, depending on what they sold or what they did. So the first three months were quite scary in the sense of, oh no, what's going to happen? The fortunate part was that the acquisition was not based off of whether or not we would be successful within the first three or six months or one year. This was a five-year objective. So when you talk about investing and you're investing over the course of a long term, these blips and these hiccups hopefully are just that. And that's how we lean into it in the very beginning. While we slowed down for work from our client side, we were able to actually double down on taking on new processes and taking the time to train the team on those new processes as well with the spare time that they had. So when the clients came back later that year towards fall and Christmas, we were actually able to have the team somewhat trained in some of the new stuff that we had needed them to learn. Yeah, that's a tough time to be doing any transition because the world got thrown upside down. Um, Alex, first of all, I want to thank you. I have one last question. Before I ask it, I want to point people to check out antisocialsolutions.com and um, you know, just poke around their website and more episodes of the podcast. My last question, Alex, is just some of your favorite resources. That resources could be some of your favorite business or leadership books. It could be some of your favorite software. It could be uh, a mentor, um, whether it's distant or you know, actual mentor of yours. What are some of your favorite resources we can point people towards? Oh, I don't remember the uh, the author at this point, but there was a book called Drive. Uh, hmm. Daniel Pink, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. He, I when I read that, there was I learned a lot about ops, <laughs> ops and sales in that one. So I do actually recommend um, people read that one if they have an opportunity. Um, outside of that, you know, the, I, I don't, I unfortunately haven't taken on any mentors myself, which I, in hindsight should have, <laughs> and I would recommend people go and seek mentors if, as they learn and grow, um, I spend a lot of time, uh, really skiing. <laughs> uh, and that was kind of my form of meditation. So, you know, if it's not, if it's not going out researching, finding people to help you out, it's just take a sport, find a hobby that's going to challenge you outside of work, because that is going to be what allows you to really excel when you go back to work. Um, no, I love that. Any, you know, from a software perspective, uh, or tech stack, what, what things do you like to use on a daily, weekly basis? Oh, man, I've used every single one. <laughs> Each one completely depends on what you need. Uh, I believe the agency right now is leaning pretty heavily on Monday. Uh, it's a supercharged spreadsheet tool, so which is uh, works well for that agency. Uh, but I also work with Asana and our boot camp <laughs> uh, for other, other companies. Slack is always really helpful. Uh, you know, the, I guess the biggest, the biggest thing I'd recommend is just be really organized with all of your documents and your finance. As you grow as an agency, that is going to be what allows you to be acquired. And that's actually going to be what saves you time when someone comes around asking for more information. Um, that means creating good processes on things like Google Drive and actually creating processes across those tools I just mentioned. Alex? Thank you so much. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast and we'll see everyone next time. Thanks, Thank Alex. you very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.